Hi guys, welcome to the show. In our show, the differentiators, we talk to achievers from various backgrounds to understand their journeys, which will help us unlock key insights and ideas that will stimulate our learning and growth. I'm your host, Aditya, and I have my co-host, Yashas, and Shreyas with me. Uh, so just before uh, we start off, uh, I just want to make a small request to the viewers and subscribers watching this. Uh, if you find our content valuable, whatever we have uploaded so far, then uh, please share it with many like-minded people who you think may like it. Uh, I know our content is quite long, but it's also very insightful as well. So why I say this is because we are a young channel and just we started off just about a week ago. And, uh, you know, so YouTube's rec algorithm or recommendation engine is, is yet to pick up our context of the videos that we put out. So our videos will not be recommended to people who might watch something similar on YouTube. So uh, in the initial days to grow organically and uh, you know, to drive traffic to our channel and to our videos from external sources, uh, you know, uh, be it WhatsApp or social media platforms will be very valuable to us. Um, also, after this ep episode is uploaded, we will come up with another video uh, just to address our value proposition so that uh, our viewers and subscribers and a lot of other guys can decide uh, you know, uh, what kind of content that we uh, can understand, what kind of content that we put out, and they'll have more clarity on what we do and why we do it. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Uh, so our differentiator for today is uh, Hemant Kumar. Uh, Hemant is the co-founder and CEO of Pontis. Uh, he has 14 years of experience in enterprise to enterprise uh, uh, you know, delivery and product leadership. He was also the CIO of Unocoin, and uh, which is it's a pretty big deal, by the way. And uh, he was also involved in setting up Mint, which was also a blockchain startup. Uh, right now, he is uh, the CEO of Pontus. So uh, just to know, just to give you some context, uh, Pontus was recently funded by AE Ventures, which is a company that funds only blockchain startups. So out of 176 companies, Heyman's company, Point Pontus, was also one of them. So congratulations for that, Heyman. Uh, uh, Thank you. Great Thank you, Aditya. And I, uh, they also just started out Pontus earlier this year, and uh, they're making very good rapid progress, uh, I must say. So uh, we'll get to what Pontus is, we'll, uh, you know, uh, so that you can also share all your journey. So before we start off, uh, I'd like to first, uh, my first question would be, um, you know, why, why did you take up entrepreneurship? I mean, you had 14 years of work experience in other companies. So why entrepreneurship? Why, why after 14 years? Why not before? Or, uh, you know, <laughs> you know uh, it's an interesting question and a valid question. Thank you. So uh, it was back in 2016. Uh, I was a senior delivery manager in TCS. Right. Um, you know, regular stuff, uh, senior position. I mean, you know, the kind of responsibility that comes with the kind of company that we are working with. And uh, over a period of time, probably over a period of uh, six months to one year or probably 18 months, I started noticing a pattern, right? What is the pattern? Pattern is I'm solving the same kind of problems over and over. So for me, I, that is not progress. I mean, see, you can have all the promotions, you can have all the hikes in salary, you can have all the best team working for you. But if you are solving the same problem over and over again, uh, it, you kind of get uh, saturated for, with it, right? For the lack of a better word. And honestly, I didn't have any, uh, you know, uh, a kind of a bad answer or bad reason to quit TCS. I mean, good reason rather, <laughs> good reason to quit TCS because I could have just continued with it I could have just continued with the kind of stuff uh, that you would normally get with that kind of a senior position in TCS. But uh, that's when uh, the Bitcoin Unocoin thing happened to me. When Unocoin uh, tried to offer me a job, the CEO of the company, I think I uh, gave a very, very serious thought about it. And that coincided with the kind of thought process that I was going through at that point in time. I was, th I was thinking like, why not take a leap of faith from here? I know I'm late. I know I'm late in this kind of a journey some, because after 10, 12, 13 years, you don't do entrepreneurship. After having a very steady corporate job, you don't just jump into you know, entrepreneurship. It's a very risky, risky proposition. Uh, but, I, after, but I took a calculated risk, 
um, it's not like I was just jump, you know, with with a very blind faith. I took a calculated risk because I knew Unocoin was funded. It has a very good branding at that point in time, and blockchain was happening. And I was deeply passionate about blockchain. It was a very very dear thing to me. And I will talk about blockchain in a moment. Uh, I thought, okay, why not? In, instead of saying I want to, why not? That was my, <laughs> you know, to be, I'm being very honest with you. Right. So. 2016 November is when I uh, joined Unocoin and that's the beginning of my my stint with startup and startup ecosystem and uh, and also I thought if there is ever a chance for me to be an entrepreneur I believe this would be a good starting point for me because rather than just jumping into the this this entire whole entrepreneurship journey without having any kind of a background or a knowledge or any sort of an experience with it start joining a startup already an existing startup would give you a flavor of how it works how things work how how you run a startup from both from a business point of view from a technology point of view and i thought it would be a good starting point so all these reasons made me you know let me go with this let me let me take this offer let me take this uh, you know uh, job offer that i got in fact it was it came to me rather than me going to them that was the kind of uh, so because that's that happened in november 2016 is when i joined unocoin so that that's the beginning of my startup uh, okay. uh, space and that's why i joined sure. so in unocoin what was uh, your exact responsibility uh, what were you doing at unocoin unocoin see um, okay uh, to be honest with you uh, unocoin when I joined Unocoin, I think there were a couple of things which were expected out of me, right? Right from building a new team, completely building the new platform, a complete transformation of the digital transformation project that they wanted to do, all that. But it so happened, in the hindsight, if I look at it, it so happened that I did just more than that. And uh, the, the, the team was fantastic. And when I joined, um, there were around 22 people, including me, Unocoin. And uh, in, at one point, at the peak, we were 124 people. <laughs> yeah, so from 24 people to 124 people, I think that journey, I was there all through, right from hiring, building the team, mentoring the teams, uh, designing the systems, deploying the systems, developing, development of it. I was managing the entire IT shop at Onocoin, right? Uh, so basically, I was responsible for entire operations on the IT ground, IT team, and also operations. There was a huge call center uh, backing the customers and customer queries, addressing them. And I was the person, key person responsible for, for person for uh, this entire organization. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as in the process, since it was a very new company and something which was uh, also coming up and uh, founders knew that uh, from a culture's perspective, from a startup co or a company's perspective, there has to be a lot of things that has to be done. And that's where I pitch it in as well. So I'm happy to say, I think the kind of culture we built at Unocoin is one of the best and probably a, a template kind of a thing for any startup culture, startup company, startup, right? And uh, yeah, so it's not just managing the IT team responsible for the entire IT organization, also a, a little more than what it is. <laughs> it's always more than what it is, especially for entrepreneurs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, or uh, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that actually shows the level of diverse experiences that one will need to start off as an entrepreneur. So, now diving into blockchain. So, yeah. just for our viewers, if you can put it out in simple terms, what is blockchain? Okay. Simple terms, right? I, I don't want to use technology term, technical terms. Let me put it simple. Let me keep it very, very simple. Um, at a cruising altitude, right? When you are like 30, 40,000 feet level, if you look at blockchain, it is like a database. Nothing else. It's, it is a database. And of course, it's a oversimplification of it. To some extent, it is wrong, but I'll get to that later. But when you land <laughs> and when you see blockchain I know, up close, that's when you see the real differences between a database and a blockchain. The differences are not just subtle, but the differences are philosophical of nature, right? The, the way you store records, the way you retrieve them, who controls it, 
who manages it how do, how is that and you know, a protocol works at the fundamental level it's a it's it's a completely new world so that's from a that's from introduction so what it is basically is uh what it what what does it do blockchain right it 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 actually solves one single problem what is it it solves something called double spending what is double spending let me give you an example simple example without getting way too technical um let's say we are four here in this stream let's say we are streaming this live on youtube and let's say 1000 people are watching it right and aditya i think there is a nice uh, probably a poster or something i see in the background I, aditya says hemant i want to i will give this poster to you uh in front in the stream in front of 1000 people and 1000 people are a witness to it right tomorrow aditya cannot say uh, i don't i don't i don't give and you don't have any you know evidence for it because he knows 1000 people have witnessed it so that's a real asset real world asset because it's a poster it's a physical thing and people have seen it let's replace that poster with a a digital asset let's say uh, there is a poster and you take a photo of that and you say this is the only digital copy that i have and i will sell it to you or i will give it to you so if if aditya wants to cheat he can actually say that to two people or more than two people and take money from them right so basically you are giving the same thing for more than two people which you are not supposed to do so this is a double spending problem where where you cannot control the legitimacy or 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 what how do you say it um the, you cannot just curb the fraud with uh, that happens with a digital asset so blockchain solves that right for example you order something and uh, and, and and a buyer and a seller right you order something and the money reaches that buyer a seller before that you cancel it but the product has already reached you in terms through the delivery and you can retract it so basically you are saying i have spent it it has not reached me and it can be done with more than one seller right so this is a double spending problem basically it happens only with the digital assets let's say if it is a physical asset it could be a poster it could be an apple or it could be anything this doesn't happen because there are witnesses to it there is a thing for it here without having to have a witness without having to have to worry about what happens to my money you can still do a transaction between two complete strangers without having to worry about what is going to happen to my money so that that is what blockchain is so you don't have to trust anybody so that's why they are called trustless networks where trust is not required so no. so basically what is double spending in a summary is uh, you would be able to spend the same coin digital coin that you have with two multi, you know, multiple people that's the double spending right it's like uh, if i have to give an analogy it is like uh, having a counterfeit money with you right where if you are able to print it on your own you can actually say you know use that to sell the different as you know different uh, you know different uh, stuff objects so that that is what blockchain solves double spending so 2009 satoshi nakamoto whoever he is or she is or they are <laughs> uh they came up with this ingenious idea of how to solve the double spending problem in a in a very very elegant way and that's what is blockchain and that's the genesis of how bitcoin happened in back in 2009 yeah hemant uh, it was a great thing to know about blockchains so uh, knowing about blockchains how can blockchain uh, change the current financial systems yeah i think it goes back to the philosophy of why it was first uh, you know introduced that kind of a system right so if you look at the primary nature of blockchains they are completely decentralized in nature in the sense you do not have to trust anybody to actually uh, do any sort of a transaction a and b Com- everything is actually backed or or run by mathematics or cryptography in the back end it is very 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 difficult to hack into blockchains es- especially blockchains which has a decent amount of ecosystem uh, in in terms of size and thirdly once you write something into blockchain it is in- almost in- almost like it is impossible to actually change it 
without any consent or without any uh, you know uh, 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 consent with other people so all these things actually has a huge impact in terms of how you run the system so it's not just finance it is going to uh, probably affect each and every uh, conventional system that we have had it can actually revolutionize those things like for example let's take the finance example finance itself as an i know first example today uh, if i have to take a loan let's say right what do you do you the conventional way how do the banks disperse loans they will take normally collateral or something and you go to a bank you keep that collateral as your asset as a collateral and in return they will give you a loan evaluating what's the, based on the value of the asset that you are keep it kept it as a collateral right in this whole process you are actually trusting the bank you trust that banks will hold on to my asset no matter what they will manage my asset in a very secure fashion but if something goes wrong actually you lose your collaterals right so you don't in 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 the blockchain world you do not have to trust anybody you take get your crypto asset put it into a smart contract which is not under any control anybody anyway and you can actually have a smart contract to do things based on the consent that you have had with the other party so there is no person or a team manually doing decisions or flipping the switches to actually affect the transaction so that way and this is a very very liberating uh, uh, uh revelation rather a liberating experience or liberating phenomenon because all of a sudden this entire thing blows up into a phenomena where you do not have to trust people to do transactions and my my collateral is safe not because of i trust someone because i trust in the mathematics or cryptography cryptography and because i trust in the technology and c it is not under any institutional oversight in the sense uh, all of a sudden you can't uh, you know just the way it happened in 2016 right demonetization what happened overnight the 500 rupee note became a just a piece of junk paper that won't happen with crypto or blockchain nobody can take money or devalue money just because someone said so so there is no over institutional oversight uh, in time with respect to blockchain assets so that these three together obviously will have a huge impact in terms of how we run the systems right and also uh, in terms of efficiency let's talk about uh, slightly something else apart from finance let's talk about supply chain right as you know there is a huge number of partners or vendors in this entire supply chain cycle correct right from someone who sources the material to someone who manages to you know someone who manufactures the actual product a distribution channel then the dealers then the customers then the end users this entire channel it everything is run by normally these days as you know through a very very manual process right you can actually have blockchain in this space in for this entire setup and trigger payments events transactions record them in a very very uh, smart way thereby reducing the time increasing the efficiency and all, both in terms of cost and time and 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 yet uh, not be uh, not be susceptible for any sort of a fraud so that's that's something which is phenomenal which has never happened before before blockchain Right. So, so basically blockchain takes out the properties of oversight by an institution and uh, trying to make things more efficient so uh, my next question would be what is decentralized finance and how does blockchain sit with the whole ecosystem of decentralized finance yeah decentralized finance is something which 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 happened or gained traction in the last uh, uh 18 to 24 months to be very honest it's actually from 20 uh 2018 november right it's not even 2 years so what is decentralized finance is basically i think you need a bit of a context i think it goes back to what happened in 2009 with bitcoin right with bitcoin mm-hmm. what happened is you decentralized the value transfer person a wants to send money to person b without any sort of a intermediary today you can't do that without blockchain i mean today you can do that without blockchain but you can you need to go to a payment provider or a payment uh, settler or a bank or a credit card you, only that basically it means there is a third 
party in between you and the person who is receiving money bitcoin chain it's that blockchain chain is that without any intermediary you can that is a fundamental tenet of an economy right value transfer what is the next step in that evolution the next step is obviously finance right i want to lend money and i want to take loans if if i have to talk about in conventional terms this is nothing but banking right that's what banking's do basically right you they lend they take the deposits fixed deposits that you give for a certain amount of interest let's say a bank gives you a home loan at around 9% and but at the same time for the fixed fixed deposit that you open with them they will give you only 5.5% or 6% the arbitrage between them is what is controlled by the bank and that's how they make the money and they balance the two sides based on how many people who are ready to lend uh, how many people who are ready to borrow right now in terms of uh, in terms of defi replace this bank with a smart contract you have decentralized finance as simple as that you can do everything that you have doing with a bank but now it's completely decentralized it's not a person it's not an organization it's not a committee it's not a government but it's a simple set of contracts which govern which define this in transaction inflow and outflow of money so if you want to let's say uh, uh let's say you have one bitcoin example and you want to earn money based on further interest so the, what do you do right normally you go to a bank say guys i want to open a fixed deposit you will fix it you deposit let's say 1 lakh rupees and they'll give 5 5% or 6% of interest at the end of the year you withdraw 1 lakh 6000 right replace that cash with bitcoin or crypto for that matter and that is defi mints basically um, mints basically happened back in january 2019 time frame and that's when i met my co-founder nitin through a meetups that we were doing uh, we were both active in both blockchain space in terms of meetups and stuff and uh, one thing led to another it uh, happened over a coffee <laughs> where we thought of having a global and universal uh, rewards uh, and the, you know rewards and loyalty system so what happened was Uh, the, the the thought process was very simple where today the entire royalty and reward space is completely institutional right what i mean by that is you go to a reliance shop or you go to a starbucks or you go to a, you know emirates airlines they have their own rewards and uh, you know loyalty systems and these these rewards are not interoperable correct so you can't use reliance points in starbucks and vice versa in pantaloons or vice versa in lifestyle things like that right the idea was why don't we club all of this build a highway for all customers at all businesses you know without any sort of a boundary with blockchain in the back end right so the idea was that that that's how it all started off and the 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 vision was to have a uh, a very very seamless system where you go to a starbucks cafe have a cup of coffee spend money get points use those points to book a flight and why you know things like that it's a, everything is interconnected and that way you have you are bringing value to the end users and also you are going to bring value to the merchants who are selling products and services and at the same time uh you are making entire world like a one big uh, you know massive village where everything is interconnected right but and and apart from this that is one half of the story the second half of the story is uh we are going to we were planning to give market intelligence to the customers meaning uh we will have a lot of insights in terms of uh, how the customer is behaving and what he needs or what she needs where does he or she spends money what are his interests are and stuff like that based on that we would give intelligence and uh, tools for the merchants to target their customers in a more specific manner for example um today the facebook ad campaigns youtube ad campaigns have you if you have used uh, any of those it's it's more like a carpet bombing sort of a thing you can't pinpoint to which 
end user you need to target your ad to the, of course there are certain demographics uh, that you can choose and stuff but end of the day you do not know where it will end up and what is the cycle of that ad coming back to you as a from a from a business point of view so the mint's proposition was that because we have merchant data because we will have customer data we will give customer intelligence to the customer uh, to the merchant so that they can create very very effective marketing campaigns right for example let's say there is a jewelry shop and they want to target uh, uh, all the customers and they want to let's say roll out 5% discount for everyone in a particular locality right and who have spent at least 10000 rupees in gold in the last 6 months and whose annual income is more than let's say 10 lakhs mm -hmm. so this is a very 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 specific campaign where the chances of conversion is very high compared to a regular carpet bombing kind of a campaign right so what is what happens in this case is let's say uh, in a conventional way if if this campaign goes to not in the mince campaign the conventional campaigns if that goes to a guy who is a student there is no point i mean why would a student spend money on gold right sure. but in our case i can choose a specific set of audience for which they would be rewarded and it would be a win win situation for both merchants and the users users would see only relevant details merchant can target only relevant tar you know audience in the process both of them are winners and is because we give this entire platform we are going to be the platform owners so that was the idea of mints it's a rather ambitious definitely rather capital intensive uh, but but we re genuinely thought this this would work and uh, that that's the idea of mints that 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 was back in uh, january it started off and we spent a lot of time in terms of market research sp speaking to customers speaking to existing loyalty customers merchants of tier 1 tier 2 cities did a uh, elaborate surveys and stuff we had our data and uh, after probably 4 or 5 months then we started after having convinced that this model is going to work we started building the product after understanding the magnitude of the problem and a reasonable success uh, levels then we started building the problem and we had issues raising money uh, a typical startup challenge uh, uh, but yeah, eventually it fell flat uh, in, in, in this year uh, and probably COVID was final, uh, you know, the nail in the coffin. But yeah, I think it's not dead yet. Uh, but because of funding, because of this, I think uh, it is going to be, it, it is in a stealth mode. And that's when ha Pontis also happened. So uh, most of the, my focus is on Pontis right now, Dan and Mints. Right. So coming back to Pontes, right? Uh, so what what does Pontes actually do? I know I understand Pontes is, is a Greek word for bridge. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> how do, how does uh, Pontes actually work? Uh, so I think this is a B two B plug and play solution for cryptocurrency exchanges. Correct. So the first, so I have two parts uh, to this question. So yeah. first thing is, what do cryptocurrency exchanges have to offer? And second thing is. How, how is Pontus helping uh, cryptocurrencies value proposition? Yeah, good question. So uh, there are two things. I think that holds. Let's understand what cryptocurrency exchanges do right now. Right now, they, they are just a trading trading platforms. Mm -hmm. Aditya wants to sell Bitcoin. Shreyas wants to buy. And they the, these two orders would be matched and the commission would be going to the exchange. That's simple, like a, just a regular, normal uh, day of the mill, uh, you know, exchange. That's all. That's all exchanges do. Now, on the other hand, DeFi is happening. As I told you, it is a phenomenal process, phenomenal idea. Uh, it is the next step in the evolution in terms of cryptocurrency. Everyone is talking about DeFi, and numbers prove that. Traction proves that. Uh, just in the last six months, just to give you a perspective, just in the last six months, more than six billion dollars worth of crypto has been locked in DeFi from zero almost zero right and uh, from 10000 20000 customers now it's probably around 350000 customers in a matter of 4 to 5 months so everyone is talking about defi and they see the value in this in one way or the other right now what is happening is um, because defi is attractive it's like this 
Hemant, I have Bitcoin. And in fact, my idea for Bitcoin is happened back in UnoCoin when I was talking to my customers. Uh, well, I think the standard question was, Hemant, how can I make my crypto earn for me? I don't want to trade. I don't want to take risks. And, uh, and yet I want my crypto to do something for me because they started seeing it as an asset. A, and second thing is, Hemant, I want to do more than trading. Right? I, want, I am very bullish on Ethereum. I am very bullish on Bitcoin. But I can't do much uh, on the exchange. But back then, I, had a, I didn't have a very convincing answer, to be honest. So come, D, come 2019, DeFi was happening. Then I thought, OK, fantastic. There is a demand for this kind of a product. There is a people who want to have this kind of you know, place or a space that is emerging, which will address these concerns or demand. You know, one plus one is two. So uh, of course, I was not the only person who thought about it. There were many other people who had thought about it. And they had done a lot of B2C applications, right? Where, guys, download this wallet, download this application. You can do everything related to crypto, uh, DeFi. So the way it works is you get your holdings from wherever you have crypto holdings, wherever you have, put it into our R application, maintain your own wallet, and you can do all the DeFi stuff lending borrowing the ones which we talked about right now the problem here is uh, none of these b2c applications offer a complete uh, comprehensive features for example what there is one uh, application which does only couple of protocols not all the protocols there is another application which will demand you a lot of things from a technicality perspective like they have they expect you to maintain your own wallet they expect you to do your own private key management and all that stuff so essentially uh, what happens is what happened is slowly defi became a very niche 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 space not many people can do defi because of, because because of the complexities involved uh, multiple hops involved uh, nobody obviously it's, it it stopped being a mass product so what we did is we took a completely different approach inside out approach instead of bringing people to DeFi, we wanted to bring DeFi to the people how uh, we wanted to collaborate with exchanges and why it was a very key key move and very critical uh, uh, move because exchanges were losing money because of DeFi. Mm. because you know DeFi, you can earn money you can earn interest passive interest i don't want to i don't have to do anything just give crypto your crypto to their uh, to them you would start earning interest as simple as that instead of keeping it on simply on an exchange i'll just put it on uh, DeFi protocol i will start on more crypto mm. so what happened was people started uh, you know uh, withdrawing holdings from the exchange and started putting it into DeFi. so exchanges are losing people exchanges are losing holdings they are losing customers they are losing money mm. so and user side also it's also a very sad story as i told you it's very complex to deal with DeFi. so we thought let's let's address this complexity let's address this concern let's address this is problem inside out instead of building another application we have dozens of applications already in DeFi space let's do a b2b model where there is DeFi in one hand exchanges on the other pontis becomes a bridge between these two people so we aggregate all the different protocols offer it to the exchanges so the exchange itself becomes DeFi capable natively so if an exchange user wants to do DeFi transactions or want to you know dabble their hands with DeFi, they can do so being on the exchange itself everything comes natively right they don't have to withdraw they don't have to maintain a new wallet no private key management everything is simple so they can do everything related to crypto trading buying selling lending borrowing including DeFi under one roof is a hoga exchanges will make money because their customers are making money mm. and their customers are making money because of DeFi. in this whole process they are winners customers are winners end users are winners exchanges are winners and we obviously will charge customers our customers are ex exchanges and we will charge them on a revenue sharing model so that's the idea of Pontus. So basically, we are the bridge between DeFi and crypto exchanges. We make DeFi simple. The idea is, ultimate vision is very simple. Idea is, 
we want to bring finance i mean we started off with defi but we have a larger vision where we want to bring easy finance to everyone in the world i, I that's a utopian dream but uh, idea is simple where anyone with, with just more than a smart contract and an internet connection should be able to access financing easy finance that's our idea that's our vision that's what pontis wants to do in the long run and we started off with defi and i i kept saying uh, to people like we want to be the uber for finance crypto finance or finance for that matter basically we are the aggregators we bring all the liquidity providers aggregate them and give it to the our customers and in the whole process everybody is a winner like so, like yeah agri you know aggregator business so we are another aggregator yeah so is there anything like this similar out there already maybe not in india or maybe in india or outside the world is there anything out there like this no b2b space we are the first i think probably that's what attracted the uh, accelerators and vcs right. uh we are the first who thought of this inside out approach completely unconventional completely lateral uh because everyone started as soon as you say defi okay let me create a wallet let me create a uh, this thing let me go after the end users that's what people did that's what dozens of startups did right. and just to give you a perspective uh, i think the number of users end users today is around 350000 people in defi correct with with let's say we go live with our first custom first customer which is an exchange and that customer let's say has a half a million customers so what it took 2 years for these guys to bring 350000 people we can actually get to half a million customers in on day 1 right so that's the idea of pontus i think that's that is something phenomenal and in terms of growth i think uh, uh we, that that's a lot of potential and promise which is why probably uh, it was it was a very good idea from a accelerator perspective or a vc's perspective right so from a vc's perspective right i mean uh, i know that you were recently uh, you, you won that competition that was organized by this uh, vc firm and uh, there were there were other companies as well i think about 1 176 companies were there and you were one among the three to get selected so i believe that there were multiple rounds of scrutiny and selection process there were yeah. multiple rounds right? yeah so, yeah so can you just get into the little details of what happened in every round so that sure. uh, that would that would be helpful for us and also for people who might be watching and listening to this definitely definitely yeah. so it was actually not a vc firm it was actually a accelerator so there are accelerators who ac uh, help you accelerate your business for with a early stage startup mm -hmm. so this this one is called ae ventures who's based out of sofia bulgaria it's a europe based fund though they started the fourth batch in india for mm -hmm. only for blockchain companies so we applied back in december january time frame and uh, we got our first call saying that we we want to talk to you mm -hmm. in the month of february i believe right and uh, we had a very detailed chat in terms of uh, what point is what are we trying to do and that is when we just kind of you know solidified the shape and form of pontus and uh, we had a very detailed chat with them and uh, in terms of what pontis wants to do how we are trying to do what is in it for the customers and stuff and that was the first round of interview and uh, second round of interview happened a week later and this was more in terms of uh, what is the kind of traction you have have you spoken to any customers what is their initial feedback uh, would they be buying this and all that stuff and fortunately we had all done all that homework because we didn't want to do the repeat the same mistakes that we did in mints so we did all that research up front and second that was the second round and third round was uh, basically going through a very intense uh, one week uh, one week uh, uh, programs with lot of sessions back to back it's a day eight day full or seven days of uh, program which happened in march time frame i believe mm -hmm. and where all the applicants out of that 176 that you talked about i think now it boiled down to 16 at that point in time after three rounds mm -hmm. so we had to undergo that sessions as intense sessions of it it covered almost everything product discovery business model canvassing 
uh, financing and and product modeling and all that stuff right typical startup entrepreneurial stuff and at the end of it there was a demo day a pitch day and uh, out of 16 i think seven were tra- you know seven uh, were selected pontis was one of them and uh, that 16 became seven and then there was a demo demo day that is when you pitch to a larger public in front of vcs and 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 compete with other six companies for the spot that you want to be in right mm. and uh, because of covid that didn't happen in a physical format and but one month later uh, it happened over online and the demo day was probably in the first week of may uh, it's been close to 3 months now and uh, we pitched pontis pitched as part of the demo day and out of 7 they selected 3 and pontis was one among them mm. so i think again what it takes in this case of is the, is it, to 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 have this kind of a success or if i can call it success is basically the kind of clarity you have with respect to your customers and with respect to your product and with respect to the problem statement that you are trying to solve we were very very clear we were very very clear in terms of what we want to build uh, i think probably that pushed us and also added to that it's a good team and uh, <laughs> nitin nitin is a very senior to me my co-founder uh because uh and he had a he had had a lot of experience from an IT corporate experience and also had had dabbled with couple of startups in the past he has more more than 23 years of experience so cumulatively we have more than 35 years of experience in 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 IT and probably that was also a, a small factor which which made uh the decision tilt in our favor because experience no, there's nothing like experience i have i have built products we have built product we have built teams in the past so that is not going to be a challenge Pro- they know that and probably that's kind of probably worked in our favor too right while we i mean that's quite inspiring to hear about the journey that you had uh, and while we are there on the topic of accelerators the startups usually have this dilemma should we go in for an accelerator should we go all alone yeah It, I mean, I'm just gender, genderically asking. Um, yeah. What would your suggestion be? Like, is it good for a startup to go in for all these accelerators, or do you know, like, just go? For no, I, I, I would. I would suggest. It depends on the paradigm. I'll tell you why. Because there are a couple of things that you need to be aware of uh, when you're working on a problem statement. There is a. There are several traps that you can fall into in your entrepreneurial journey, owing to the confirmation bias that you will have. i think uh, i think all of you probably know what is confirmation bias right so so i think we should avoid all those traps mm. and there is if if there is no third person looking at it there is high chance that all the co-founders probably falling into that confirmation bias traps Pro- and that affects the success factors of the product or the company itself right what 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 acu- you know uh, accelerators do and what incubators do is to give you a perspective from a third person and say uh, and be very objective about how good the model is how how clearly are you thinking about your problem statement and it's always good to have a third person validating you right i mean uh, i i think that's a good thing because a you are you need to be open to the feedback and b uh, there is a high chance because of a high chance of you falling into a confirmation bias traps it's always better to have a third person's perspective about what you think and before you even when pitched to your first vc i think that helps a lot and that's where accelerators come into picture and honestly there are quite a few uh, accelerators across the world today who do a very very commendable job in terms of mentoring the founders mentoring the entrepreneurs course correcting them and talking to them in terms of what they do or what they're doing right or they're doing wrong and how to, how, how can they you know come back to the track and things like that and there are quite a few accelerators like that who do that and it 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 depends on in 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 at what point of journey you are in and that brings and that kind of decides whether you want to go for a you know accelerator or not for example there are three stages and in a broadly for a startup or a company there is 0 to 1 1 to 10 10 to 100 right 0 to 1 is where probably you are you know accelerators and incubators coming to picture that's where you need to have your uh, focus you know right have the uh, proper validation of the problem statement and see if a problem statement and the solution are matching 
you know, in a, in a, in a, in a way which is conducive to both the consumers and your end users, and then start building on it. And then that is when you need money from one to 10. One to 10 is the initial growth. 10 mm -hmm. to 100 is scaling, right? So I think most of the accelerators come in, in, in that zero to one and sometimes one to 10 as well, depending on the accelerator. But it does help if it's accelerated. Like for example, let me not uh, hesitate in taking the names. Why Combinator? It's a very, very good accelerator. There's a very good genuine people who are genuinely trying to help you out with your with your startup. Right, I think, uh, but no, again, not all accelerators are good. <laughs> but anyway, but the point is this: the point is, uh, you. It's always good to have a third person's perspective, uh, uh, just 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 to eliminate the cognitive biases that you might have, as a as a set of co-founders that 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 you're working with. Yep, oh, that's very true. Uh, so, uh, Aditya, want to take it forward? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we were uh, talking about Fontes and uh, how uh, you know, an accelerator came in and uh, how we are, we are funded. Obviously, we don't want to disclose the details of the funding. Because, no, that's, that's not, not very secret. It's just that it is not finalized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I was thinking, would there be additional rounds of funding? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think uh, what we pitched to A Ventures was just the cost of MVP. Right, and what does it take to actually just to go live with our product? Obviously, ours was a much bigger round. Uh, we are actually uh, looking to write at this point in time. We are looking to raise 550k. What AE Ventures confirmed was only a part of it. I mean, we we, we asked for only that part of it because it was the cost of the MVP of we going live. And uh, yes, it's a much bigger round of that what we are uh, trying to raise funds with. Right. So. These accelerators are, in general, in VC forms, uh, from your experience, so what do they invest in? Do they invest in the idea or do they invest in the people? Uh, so what do you think? Uh, uh, so, it's a tricky question, dicey question, because it, you see, there are multiple things here, Aditya. It's a good question. Nobody knows the answer for this. <laughs> if, if everybody has the answer for this, I think everyone would raise money. Yeah. So I think it's actually a mix of multiple things, I would say. And they would have their own weightages to it, right? Mm -hmm. It's a mixture of multiple factors like how good is the team, and what's the kind of uh, what's the kind of skill sets these founders have, and how are they complementing each other, and what is the dynamics between them. So that forms the team aspect of it. Second is product market fit. Is there a good market for this? And if there is a market, does that is that demand is addressed by the profit uh, the product that you these guys are making? Second and thirdly, timing. If if you are too early, it's a waste. It's a waste of time for both of you. If it is too late, anyway, it's a dead game, mm -hmm. right? These three factors actually decide how good are you in terms of uh, raising money, right? I think uh, in terms of, in fact, the biggest uh, success factor lies with the timing, actually, not with funding, not with team, not with employees not with anything else. The biggest factor, according to a study, is actually timing of the product. If you are just in time with this product, and this is a product market fit, you are solving a real world problem, you are in. You are, there is a very high chance of success. Even though you do not have funding, you, even though you do not have a good team to work with. right? And timing is everything. Right. So, uh, apart from this, so uh, the other question that I had, uh, you know, was that uh, if people have to opt for decentralized finance, right? Uh, I think you touched upon this a little bit uh, previously. So, what are the loopholes that we have in our current financial system that there would be a mass adoption of decentralized finance? Because for your idea to go uh, to to become big. For everyone to embrace it, you know the end users must also embrace yeah. uh, protocols and you know products that are built using decentralized finance. Right? So, so what are the loopholes in the current in our current financial system or a banking system that people would would actually embrace this? No, I wouldn't call it loopholes. I think we all need. I think uh, this system, the current economics, the fiat system, uh, it's it's hundreds of years of old and 
over a period of time correct edit its own you know having this feedback loop mechanism uh, that's that's all fine but i think despite this why did bitcoin became famous in 2009 or in the last decade mm. not just because of the see i'll tell you you might say that's probably because of the price price uh, you know uh, appreciation that it is getting over the last decade that is not the only reason right mm. the answer is decentralization mm. nobody can actually take your money out of your own account or wallet without your consent mm. with the fiat that can actually happen nobody can devalue your money mm. without your consent yeah. with with fiat that can happen right so that that is a true blue freedom for a lot of people it's a philosophical change it's a mindset change it's not just another product bitcoin is actually if you study deep and if you if you, if you go dig deep in terms of what it actually stands for crypto in general uh, i'm not talking about any other cryptos but i'm talking about the original original gangster here og which is which is the bitcoin here that that is actually a very liberating thing for many people in terms of financial freedom mm-hmm. right and the same thing applies for the for its evolutionary product which is defi right. if if i have to believe a bank there are two options here right one is you believing with your gold assets with a bank and you believing mathematics and cryptography uh, with your crypto i mean you can say no i i don't i i don't understand crypto i don't want to believe this it's up to, fine it's absolutely fine it's a, it's an individual choice it's an individual uh, you know you know freedom to choose whichever but but the idea is what is the what is the what is the probability of something going wrong with these two systems we all know what happened with banks uh, is happening with banks yeah and at the same time i'm not i'm not saying crypto is far better because there are risks here people can actually hack into exchanges not blockchain itself but hack into exchange if exchanges are not very careful it the, the hacks can happen on the exchanges as well mm. but the philosophy matters right who would you trust on people or technology i think that, that depending on your mindset depending on where you come from your frame of reference you can pick either of them i don't want to say fiat is bad crypto is good i don't have for crypto to be good i don't have to make fiat villain villain let me just say that <laughs> right so uh, crypto by its own merit is good fiat has its own merits and it, it has its own restrictions it it all depends on what you want to embrace right yeah yeah Hemant, uh, coming back to the uh, governments losing control over uh, money due to cryptocurrencies. So, what do you uh, tell about that? Yeah, I think this is the biggest challenge for governments, right? Uh, governments. I think in one of the other interviews, I spoke about the same thing. As a government, one would like to understand the traceability of cash flow, right? Where is the cash coming from? How it is flowing through the channels and all that. That is the control that they want. on the other hand crypto doesn't have that it's not built into the system like that so the marriage of these two is the biggest challenge so probably it is one of the strangest bedfellows to to have a marriage to, you know married to you can never marry because these are two opposing views on one hand you have want to control on the other you don't want to be controlled mm. so the, ma- the 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 uh strike these two opposing philosophies is the biggest challenge i think but but i think the probably the first step towards this is the stable coins okay. i think you might have heard of uh, central bank uh, distributed coins where rupee would be a digital coin hmm. or or china's yuan they are also yeah. thinking to go digital on blockchain that would be a digital coin so where it is not true blue blockchain but at least it establishes traceability for governments probably that's the first direction towards the evolution of these two strange fellows you know coexisting with each other rather than opposing each other i think probably stable coins would be the first starting point to to have this kind of a marriage work probably and it's my personal opinion okay like uh, normal currencies do stable coins also have to back some assets uh, some physical assets no it's first of all even normal currencies do not back up 
if you are thinking fiat is based on some backing up no it's not <laughs> that gold gold standard was was dumped back in 1960s uh, so even today fiat currencies are not not backed by any uh, scientific uh, 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 methods or ways but but coming to stable coins of crypto crypto stable coins like let's say there is a famous uh, stable coin called tether usdt right and that is actually pegged softly to a dollar in the back end so you do not see the value of usdt fluctuating massively it's normally between 0.999 dollars and 1.0001 dollars it's normally fluctuates only between that because it is always pegged to the original dollar so yeah that that's basically none of, even the fiat currencies are not backed by any standards sorry <laughs> okay yeah so uh coming to quantis right so uh what what is the progress that you made uh, ever since uh you know the start fleet ventures uh you know back to you so what mm. is the progress from then until now so, so where are you with the uh, right the, so we started off in january february time so that's when it took shape and we did a lot of research we we reached out to our potential customers at that point itself even we, we even before we started building the product uh, we, because i thought let's do it right with this time right and uh, second thing is we actual building of the product happened uh, from a march april time frame it's been 3 to 4 months now as we speak uh, we are probably one month away from beta beta launch so and uh, and 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 again all this completely bootstrapped so far and a ventures ka fund abhi uh, it still it need to hit, hit the bank account yet but yes everything is bootstrapped so far so yes sir seriously you have any that's all that's always a point in starting off you know like you just have to go with the flow and try to make most of what we have on at hand i mean that's what we all engineers do best improvising <laughs> so yeah so moving on uh, what are the five potential sectors that you probably are looking where blockchain itself will mm. make a quite a impact i think i think uh... the recent happenings with what happened what what happening with the government state governments i think that probably is a good uh, starting point i think if if you have uh, heard about it i think andhra government took an initiative of going blockchain way for all the land registries so that way the ownership is intact nobody can say it is my land once it, because it's blockchain so uh, i think that's probably is one way Uh, of of adopting blockchain in a governance model. So with 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 blockchain, what happens is uh, maximum governance, governance and minimum government. Right? You do not have to have multi, so many people to actually enforce the policies, enforce the guidelines that you want to do. So uh, I think that would be a good way. And land registry and finance obviously is going to take it by storm. Uh, I I think sec and. Uh, uh, I, I think supply chain is another very, very, very good use case uh, where blockchain can be considered, and media and distribution, mm -hmm. and uh, commercialization of music as well, right? Uh, media basically, like every time you stream a, uh, a a track from a music artist, you can know who has streamed and what, and based on that, that reward would go to the right person. So things like that. I think hypothetically, uh, you can use blockchain anywhere. right you can actually because the, the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the value addition that it brings to the table is immense i think this is one of the another most famous question which i normally get asked a lot which is hemant can i use blockchain for this project right i think the answer to that is is the blockchain is by using blockchain to your product is it going to uh, benefit you 100 times than what it instead of in, not using it instead of not using it right and if the answer is yes then you need to reason your way out from there on right it i mean technically you can use blockchain for everything right it's a just a simple technology but is it going to help you in a way that you cannot uh, achieve without blockchain yes then if, if the answer is yes fantastic go with it 
uh, so from that angle from that rational it can be applied in any 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 field for that matter in, including let's say of of my mind uh, uh, hospitalization hospitals and insurance companies you can have everyone on the on the blockchain including the doctors medical universities doctors patients insurance companies insurance agents claim settlements and banks six seven different stakeholders on the blockchain the moment you would visit a doctor and you will come back with your prescription of medicines to home probably you will have your insurance settled because everything is everything is on smart contracts nobody needs to wait for any manual process everything is authorized everything is authenticated so that's one of the cases so basically as i said you can devise systems with blockchain on a pro almost literally everything right so uh, what are the regulatory concerns uh, in this area in this whole blockchain area yeah, yeah. cryptocurrencies area do you think uh, the governments would embrace this uh, a concept like this mm -hmm. no i think i think you know the answer for this what happened with india right so back in 2018 yes. uh, rbi issued a notice saying yes. that uh, uh, you know what this is take probably going beyond our control and i don't want any of the banks supporting crypto companies mm. so kind of a banking ban it was not a ban on the cryptos by the way people mistake a lot in terms of is is, is crypto legal in india and all no it is of course legal in india there are crypto companies running uh, i mean they can't run legal and be public about it <laughs> uh illegal right so what what banks did is instead of taking a stance on cryptocurrencies directly because they cannot because they, they are not the constitutional powers they do not have constitutional powers to say uh cryptos are banned they have to, it has to go through the process right someone has to produce a bill policy the bill has to be passed and then it becomes a law mm -hmm. so what banks did is what rbi did is banks they put a restriction on bank account saying you need to close down all the relationships with all the crypto exchanges that it, that you are currently running with and it happened in 2018 and uh, within 6 months almost everything came to a halt right and and uh, there was a huge declining curve many of the companies many of the good star you know crypto companies shut down because they couldn't just survive this uh onslaught of not having any business right not not every startup you know survives this kind of a uh, blow big blow and as a crypto community all the companies went to file a case against rbi <laughs> in the uh, supreme court and that went on for nearly 2 years so february 2020 march 2020 there was a historic uh, judgment saying that uh, rbi was not able to substantially prove that there is any harm or damage that can be done or has been done because of crypto and hence it doesn't have any constitutional powers or relevance of they restricting the banks to cooperate with the crypto exchanges and it asked to resume the relationships if they want to and that's when the crypto companies again uh, breathed the uh, new life into <laughs> so that came so why i'm saying this is uh, yes there has been a big amount of uh, uncertainty large amount of uncertainty in terms of how this function and lot of it has uh, is is attributed to the kind of education and knowledge about crypto and because of this uh, there has been certain uh, questions which need not be cannot be answered in terms of uh, rather let me put it this way um, the 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 regulations that has to come through the people who are regulating it obviously has to have a thorough knowledge of how cryptos work before they actually say i want to allow or i do not want to allow right but looking at the other exam other countries as an example look at what japan has done look at what look at what sweden has done look at what couple of you you know you countries in europe has done they you can actually pay government fees government taxes in crypto in many countries right and and because of fud because of uh, lack of knowledge or information the indian scene of crypto is quite haphazard 
and media is not helping sometimes it gives a one simple out of the blue article the market falls <laughs> you know you know market sentiment you know how it works right so uh, but many of the media houses also are trying to genuinely help and spread the right word about uh, crypto but but again a lot of has to be done with respect to education and uh, you know uh, or proliferation of knowledge with respect to crypto not just at the fundamental not just at the grassroots level to the public or the, to the masses but also at the highest regulatory uh, you know authorities uh, where we they have to sit and take this in a very very serious format and see what other countries are doing how they are doing and how can we do it here rather than just making a sweeping statements so yeah that that's that's what's been happening with in terms of regulations uh, so when can we expect uh, blockchain products to enter our pockets it's already there right you can there are like millions of crypto wallets hundreds of apps that you can download from the play store you can do everything right it could be a simple wallet it could be applications or it could be applications developed and deployed by the exchanges including defi applications wallets if you don't want to uh, associate with any exchange you can have a a wallet or all, all you know everything managed by your own there are browser based wallets that you can install and start using everything is already there right so is it technologically viable for one single organization to support all the ec protocols uh, for uh, cryptocurrency exchanges is it, is it possible so we are talking about pontus yeah pontus now yeah i mean see we will take one at a time right because this this is someone has to start somewhere right and 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 from from with respect to our vision collaborating with exchanges is the first step second step is making the channel agnostic we'll collaborate with the wallets so even though you are not a exchange user you can still do defi defi using this wallet that's our second step of of, of our operations and third step is probably make this entire thing blockchain agnostic today everything is based out of ethereum yes. we want to spread across all sorts of uh, exchanges uh, uh, blockchains and make uh, finance blockchain agnostic as well that's our that's our utopian dream so you mentioned that it's just only on ethereum right? uh, so i think it's it's only on ethereum uh, the whole reason why it's only on ethereum is because ethereum supports contract uh is, is that the reason uh no that that is one thing second thing is it's also the kind of reach it has right the today there are like 2000 coins to more than 2000 coins in our crypto is in the out there in the world mm -hmm. if you if i ask you what are the top 5 i know exactly what you come out with mm -hmm. right it could be bitcoin it could be ethereum it could be something else so ethereum is always number 2 so the kind of reach the kind of uh, uh, the subscription to that kind of you know philosophy or technology or the coin itself mm -hmm. it's very high obviously the traction in the ethereum blockchain is high it's not that other blockchains are not doing defi there are many other blockchains who are doing defi but in small bits and pockets but they will also come up in their own time in terms of traction and stuff but the currently the leader is ethereum big one is ethereum yeah. so moving forward maybe 5 to 10 years down the line so uh, what is the uh, what is the goal for for pontus so where do you want to be uh, yeah i think I, i i i think i told you this like like 5 6 years down the line we want to enable people finance for anyone in the world with just with a smartphone and an internet connection that's it very very simple we want to bring finance to everyone hmm. we are irrespective of where he is what he is and 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 what kind of background he has or she has it doesn't should not matter hmm. with simple simple smartphone simple internet and and a normal internet connection we should have the capability of or he or she should have the capability of doing finance just the way other guys do right right that's our ultimate goal So uh, the next question is, uh, what do you think are the skill sets that are required, especially for uh, for young professionals or students who want to get employed in the in the blockchain space? So, what are the technical yeah. skill sets uh, that may be needed? Uh, 
for them to for them to get employed. So what do you see that? How, how does that uh, play out? In yeah, there are a couple of uh, technical stacks. It's a separate tech stack that uh, if, if you want to call yourself a blockchain developer, you need to be aware of certain things like mm-hmm. how to uh, how the blockchain works in the, at a fundamental level, right? Right from setting up a node, what are the different programming languages that are out there for with respect to different blockchains? Like, mm-hmm. for example, I'll take a specific example, uh, Ethereum, right? If you yeah. want to if you want to develop a smart contract and deploy it on Ethereum, uh, Solidity is the best way of doing it. Solidity is a programming language where it will allow you to write smart contracts. And there are tools to the way with which you can deploy them on the Ethereum blockchain. So you need to learn Solidity for that. Solidity, Truffle, there are certain textiles tools that are out there, very open source again. And combining this, this is the, all these are called Web3, by the way. We had seen Web. We had seen Web 2.0, and this is called Web 3.0, Web 3. And there's a set of libraries that you need to be accustomed to or aware of, and uh, the where where uh, it will enable you to do things on the blockchain space. So from that angle, yeah, there's a separate list of things: uh, Solidity, Truffle, Remix. These are the certain tools that will enable you to do development on the blockchain uh, itself. And apart from setting up the nodes, right? Uh, if you want to set up your own Ethereum node or a Bitcoin node and and expose your services to a third party guys, it requires a different kind of a skill set. So Web3 is a new thing. Along with Web3, your conventional tech stack skills, right? It could be Golang, it could be PHP Laravel, it could be Node.js, it could be Mernstack. These two together would make you a good uh, blockchain developer. Do you think our current educational system actually supports, uh, you know, students learning all these kind of skill sets? Uh, are they equipped enough to become blockchain developers uh, in the future, or do they have to just upskill themselves, you know, separately from away from the traditional education? Yeah, I think it's a very good point you brought up. I think it's a high time that we include blockchain as a part of the curriculum in colleges and universities, mm-hmm. right? I think uh, it's it's high time that we understand that that this something like blockchain is going to be very very big in the next one or two decades mm-hmm. and we need to be ready with that kind of uh, uh, onset of that kind of a technology and the kind of immense pr- promise that it brings it it only is uh, relevant that we make that as part of the curriculum itself mm-hmm. and uh, i'm i'm glad to tell you that many colleges or universities already are considering that I'm not even exaggerating because I, I just gave a guest lecture a couple of weeks ago to an university based out of Hyderabad, and they wanted me to talk about blockchain and how they can go about having a blockchain career as part of their uh, after their graduation, basically. Mm-hmm. So I think the the, the small initiatives are here and there are happening, but definitely it's going to catch up very very soon in terms of having this as part of the curriculum. Okay. okay. I, I don't have any other questions. I think we thought almost everything that we <laughs> wanted. So, uh, probably yes, yes, and say yes. Do you have anything? Yeah. Um. I think uh, all of the points that we intended to cover in this podcast have been covered. Okay. Uh, being a finance student myself, I think uh, the various applications that we are seeing out of say DeFi or blockchain coming in, I think that's something that we should be looking forward to in the future. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, mm. and uh, I think uh, what you're doing there is something in that level already. We're seeing the future happen now, and uh, that's what we're hoping your organization will bring about. Uh, we wish you all the very best with your uh, pursuit that you've taken up, and uh, we'd love to see that happening. I mean, that should. We, we, I imagine a per day when I can walk into a normal store uh, and pay with block, uh, block, uh, currency, Bitcoin. You so know what? I, no, it's interesting that you say that. It was already there. It's still there, by the way. And we at Unocoin did it like four years ago. I'm not even kidding. Yeah. You could actually walk into many, many outlets in Commercial Street, Bangalore, just like Paytm accepted. You would see a sticker called Bitcoin accepted. I'm not kidding. It's still there. And even with online, uh, Unocoin provided a Bitcoin payment gateway for Sapna Bookstore. 
you can actually oh. buy books on sapna bookstore using your bitcoin right. even today so yeah i mean that's already their shares uh, yes yeah. uh, so yeah. <laughs> so i think I, probably we need to take it to the next level next now level. where yeah. it becomes a mass adoption yeah, yeah. Uh, hoping that will happen considering the level of regulations that the governments have put in yeah. and uh, i think the that movement has already started to bring in that to mainstream yeah so i think that will somewhere down the line will meet lines uh, will meet at a uh, point where everything just falls in place yeah 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 i hope india wakes up to blockchain and defi uh, and and crypto in general very very soon compared to other countries but keeping our fingers crossed <laughs> true true Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Hemant. Uh, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to do this. Thank you so much for joining us. So, pleasure, yeah. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me, and it was great talking to you guys. And it's, I wish you all the very best for your podcast. It's a great initiative, and uh, I think I think it's evident, and I, I think it's absolutely essential as well, in terms of bringing the thought process and learnings and mistakes entrepreneurs normally do. and so that so other entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs can actually learn from them it's a great initiative and i wish you all the very best thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you for thank that you. cheers guys thank you so much bye thank you, thank you. take care and stay safe yeah you too thank you thanks thank you <laughs> bye hey guys thank you so much for tuning in we have lots more to come on this channel since we have lined up a few more guests after this be sure to like share and subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive updates In the description below I have provided the LinkedIn page link follow us on LinkedIn to receive new notifications so until next time it's goodbye